Welcome everyone to today's virtual Move the Needle, The Threat of China. My name is Stacey Blakely and I'm the CEO of the Policy Circle. We are a national nonpartisan nonprofit that informs, equips, and connects women to be more impactful citizens. I frequently tell people the best part of the Policy Circle is the people. 11,000 folks just like you who are curious, thoughtful, and committed to civic renewal in 45 states. People who invest in our mission and boost our impact. And we're especially grateful to the experts, the policymakers, and the practitioners who share their insights and experiences. We have two of those remarkable experts with us here today. Now, before we dive in, uh, I'd like to share that just yesterday we published a new policy circle brief focused on the threat of China. I encourage you to read the brief and then to convene conversations in your home, at your office, in your community center. This is a topic that we all need to be paying attention to. And thanks to our first speaker today, there is a new sense of urgency, especially in Congress, to address the threats presented by China. I am honored to uh, introduce Congressman Mike Gallagher. Mike Gallagher has represented Wisconsin's 8th District in the U.S. House of Representatives since 2017. He served for seven years on active duty in the United States Marine Corps, including two deployments to Iraq. In the 118th Congress, Representative Gallagher serves as chairman of the Select Committee on the Strategic Competition between the United States and the Chinese Communist Party. As chairman of the House Armed Services Subcommittee on Cyber Information Technologies and Innovation and on the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. From 2019 to 21, he served as the co-chairman of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. So the congressman is on a tight schedule today. So please make sure that you include your comments in our thread, in our chat. Um, and we're going to get to those as best we can. And Representative Gallagher, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on this Move the Needle. It's an honor to be with you. Well, I want to dive right in. As chairman of the Select Committee on China in this 118th Congress, can you explain the focus, role, and perhaps the power of this committee? Well, really, the speaker has asked us to do two things. One is to explain to our colleagues and, by extension, the American people, why any of this matters, why someone in Northeast Wisconsin or California, New York, should care about the threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party, why this isn't just a distant over there problem, it's a right here at home problem. And the second is to identify what is the center of gravity, the bipartisan center of gravity in Congress when it comes to smart, strong legislation we can pass, even in divided government, that puts us on a better path to preventing conflict in the short term and winning this competition or this new Cold War over the long term. So those kind of dual functions, uh, communication function, public diplomacy function combined with acting as the speaker's incubator and accelerator on good China policy are what animates the committee's work. The final thing I'd say on that second function is that because China is not just a military threat, it's also an economic threat, it's also, I would argue, an ideological threat, uh, it transcends every committee's jurisdiction. So to get anything done, you need a committee like this that can play a coordinating function and force the committees to work together work through differences when it comes to jurisdiction in order to get stuff done uh, in a Congress where we have a very narrow control of the Congress right now. One thing that I've heard you speak on that I think is valuable before we even dig in more to the conversation is sort of the distinction you make between the CCP and the Chinese people. Do you want to kind of share that a little bit before we dive in? Because I think you've done a good job of, of explaining that so people really understand when we're using different terminology about CCP and China interchangeably, how that's perhaps different than referring to the people. You know, it's interesting. I actually requested when we were voting on the legislation to create this select committee, I requested that the speaker change the name of the committee to say Chinese Communist Party. And really, that had a couple reasons. One was to, communicating, to communicate something essential about the nature of the government in China. It is a party state. Everything is subservient to the Chinese Communist Party. In fact, I would encourage people to stop referring to Xi Jinping as president, the, a term which isn't even used in China and, and conveys something that is untrue, which is that he's somehow elected by the people. He is he's better referred to as either chairman or general secretary. His power comes from the fact that he's general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. In fact, I'd go a step further and say it's it's more accurate to think of the Chinese military, what we call the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, as the military wing of the Chinese Communist Party. 
until we understand that, and that is sort of the model, this Marxist-Leninist model in which the party controls all and tells all citizens what to do. I just think we're not going to understand what we're up against. But the second thing is, particularly in light of concerns some of my friends on the Democratic side of the aisle have about um, uh, rhetoric getting out of control and potentially Asian Americans being targeted during COVID and things like that, I think the more we can make a distinction between the party and the people and point out the obvious truth which is that the people are the, in China are the primary victims of the CCP's aggression, the more we blunt that criticism and the more we win that sort of ideological component of this competition in the same way that Ronald Reagan was very skilled about constantly driving a wedge between the Soviet regime and the Russian people. And if you analyze a lot of his speeches, he's constantly invoking Russian history Russian literature, Russian jokes, in order to communicate directly with the people and point out just the brittle and absurd nature of the regime. So that's what's behind uh, that distinction, if that makes sense. No, it totally makes sense. And I, I'd love for you, if you can, in sort of short order, you know, you've already mentioned in this conversation that this is our new Cold War, as we just discussed yeah. Russia. Can you explain what led us to this moment, sort of extreme tension um, and why you are seeing sort of this movement, perhaps for more bipartisan consensus around the threats posed by the CCP? Well, first, a note on terminology. I know some people get nervous when I use this term, new Cold War. I, I should note, I, I did not coin it. Um, you know, both Walter Russell Mead and Neil Ferguson have been using it for quite some time. I find it useful uh, one, because I'm an old Cold War geek. I've always been fascinated by early Cold War history in particular. Two, I think there are similarities. And this is the whole of society competition with the Marxist-Leninist entity. It's going to require us to rethink um, basic uh, agencies and structures when it comes to national security institutions in order to confront the threat. But, and this is a big but, there are, there are very important differences between the old Cold War and the new, uh, particularly on the economic side. We never had to comp contemplate selective economic decoupling from Soviet Russia because our economies didn't really interact at all. Whereas with China, we are in fact, and this gets to your actual question, conjoined twins economically and financially with China. It's very difficult to separate that because, and the reason we, I think we found ourselves in this position is that for over two decades, we've made a basic bet on China. It was a bipartisan bet. There was a logic to it and it was that by integrating China into the global economy, it would moderate their behavior. They could become what is called a responsible stakeholder in the international system. Uh, the only problem is that it didn't work. They became more repressive internally, more aggressive externally. And now we find ourselves in a position, as the pandemic, I think, really illustrated, where they have a ton of leverage over us uh, economically, where they could threaten to cut off the export of advanced pharmaceutical ingredients and jeopardize Americans' access to life saving drugs. Um, so perhaps underlying that, and maybe the ultimate reason is just, you know, a lack of understanding about the nature of the regime, kind of a mirror imaging we tend to do. We sort of tend to graft our own Western sensibilities onto countries like Russia and China. And I think there was almost this willful naivety and blindness and a desire to take the communist out of Chinese Communist Party uh, in the pursuit of profits. Um, and we kind of told ourselves this, this, this bedtime fantasy story that well, they're not actually communist. They're not actually totalitarian. You know, they're actually capitalists. And this is just kind of their communist in name only. Uh, I think Xi Jinping has pretty much put that put that to rest. And so figuring out how we reduce the levers they have over us economically, figuring out how we can command the heights of, of uh, technology and innovation is a, is a central component of this competition. And again, something that's a little bit different than the old Cold War with Soviet uh, with the Soviet Union. Well, and I think if there were any doubts, right, about the motivation and the aggression, perhaps, that maybe people were in denial about, I think spy balloons traveling over our country, and now we're hearing something about Cuba, which I think there's some conflicting reports about that, but I was wondering if you could shed some light on reports that are coming out that you've got CCP, you know, surveillance operations just off the coast of Florida. And again, you know, we have the spy balloon. What is going on and how can we do a better job, right, as a country to, you know, protect our own, you know, national security and privacy here within the border of the U.S.? Well, the Wall Street Journal reported last week that the Chinese Communist Party is making a massive investment in Cuba to sort of upgrade a, a base that would be used primarily to spy on the United States. 
What's interesting is that the Biden administration originally came out and said, well, this isn't accurate. Uh, and then a day later said, well, it is accurate, but it's been there for a long time and, and kind of blamed it on the previous administration. Um, kind of a similar story to what happened with the balloon. There was this attempt early on uh, to downplay it um, and then, you know, a grudging admission that it was a problem. And eventually they were forced to shoot it down after it had sort of lazily drifted over the continental United States, including over nuclear ICBM facility. So for me, what I don't understand is why there's this this. Um, this reluctance to to criticize China for these acts of aggression, uh, why there seems to be an attempt to uh, whitewash some of the aggression. I, I think it probably has to do with the fact that the administration is trying to revive diplomatic and economic engagement as a core part of our approach to China. I think this is um, I think this is not going to work uh, for the same reason that it didn't work for the last 20 years. I don't think the CCP is interested in constructive engagement. And more to the point, we end up um, doing things like uh, uh, not only um, blunting our criticism of the CCP, uh, but also uh, there were reports during the balloon incident that the State Department slow rolled export controls on China, sanctions against Chinese Communist Party officials to preserve Secretary Blinken's trip to China. So it has a meaningful impact on our policy, this, this, this fear of upsetting the CCP and this desire to downplay some of their aggressive actions. With respect to this happening in our own backyard, um, it's not just Cuba. Uh, it's all across Central and South America. I mean, China has become the top trading partner for Brazil, Chile, Peru. It's the second largest trading partner for many. Uh, between Over the last 20 years, their trade with Latin America exploded from $12 billion to $315 billion. It may double again over the next decade. It then uses its economic leverage to coerce Latin American countries into advancing their interests, forcing many of them to uh, stop their recognition of Taiwan. Um, they've made massive investments in the Panama Canal, for example, in order to control a very vital strategic uh, choke point. CCP uh, companies like Huawei administer all the telecoms through uh, Panama and through the Panama Canal. So we've neglected our own backyard for far too long. We've taken the Monroe Doctrine for granted, and now the CCP is on the cusp of turning it into the Mao Doctrine. So I think that should be a massive wake-up call for all of us that we need to prioritize what's happening in our own hemisphere. Well, and when you talk about that economic leverage, right, that they have all over the country, you know, all over the world, but in particular, the U.S., the interdependence, right, that we have. You mentioned the supply chain. Uh, I was reading in an op-ed where you said, OK, maybe we get a quarter of our antibiotics from China, but even India, where we are going to go source vital drugs, get 80 percent of their raw materials, right, for these. So it's so complex and interconnected. Yeah. As a committee, how do you go about starting to identify what are possible ways of decoupling to mitigate that economic risk? Well, again, I, I approach this aspect of the competition with a great deal of humility because I think it's the most complex. It's not going to happen overnight. But I would offer up three principles for strategic decoupling or de-risking our economic engagement with China. The first is that we need to stop fueling our own destruction, whether it's an investment in a PLA affiliated company or the transfer of technology to the Chinese defense sec sector. We need to stop uh, American capital flowing into China and subsidizing it um, and stop allowing CCP firms to steal the knowledge or experience they need to take over key industries, oftentimes with the assistance of the very companies uh, the CCP seeks to replace. The second principle is that American businesses need to take off the golden blindfolds uh, when it comes to doing business in China and open their eyes to the strategic risks that are inherent. Um, perhaps a litmus test is that you, if you are afraid to recognize basic human rights abuses like genocide in public because you don't want to incur the wrath of the CCP, then you're too dependent on China. But the risks extend beyond human rights and include real financial risks from the systemic risks that VIE securities pose and their lack of shareholder protections to the risk of having your assets seized in the event of a conflict. I think we need to be clear eyed about the risks of doing business there. And third, we need to restore economic sovereignty. This is the this is the hardest part, right? How do, where do we draw the line in terms of here are the things where we just no longer want to be dependent on China? And then even more difficult is how do you then onshore or nearshore? Right now, we're, we're conducting an experiment with one of those things, semiconductors, through the CHIPS Act, where we're putting a massive government subsidy to onshore chip production. My own view is that, I mean, I'm skeptical that this is going to work because 
unless you pair that incentive with aggressive regulatory reform, I'm just not sure you're going to see a renaissance of domestic semiconductor manufacturing. Now, I could be wrong about that, but I'd like us to take a more targeted approach as we look at uh, advanced pharmaceutical ingredients, as we look at how we do tackle our dependency on China for rare earth and critical mineral processing, how we tackle uh, decoupling when it comes to energetics. These are the propellants and explosives that we put in our weapon systems. And there we're dependent on China for things we put in our weapons, which is crazy if you think about that. So what we're going to try and do on the committee is come up with a coherent framework for where we need to selectively decouple and then offer up a series of initiatives and ideas on how we can actually do it in a effective and fiscally responsible way. Well, and to your point earlier, I mean, the complexity is is pretty mind numbing, but prioritizing, right? I mean, it's I think that's some some good policy making when we start to share with our community, at least start somewhere uh, and not have paralysis. And to your point, just turn a blind eye to what's going on. Really, I'd love to take a, a quick little turn. And uh, we've got some questions in the chat already about TikTok. And we know this has been a conversation um, that there's been many uh, instances where the, the thrust of the conversation is concern about privacy. Um, you know, you've got the FBI saying more than likely as an American adult that China has stolen your, your information at some point. Uh, can you address that threat and, and how I think a lot of folks uh, out here are concerned about their use, their children's use of TikTok? Well, let me confess, uh, I, I bring a bias to this debate, which is that I have, I have two daughters. Uh, mm -hmm. One will turn three next week. The other is nine months. Uh, so I, I need to solve this problem before they're at an age where they have a phone, mm -hmm. and uh, it becomes a real problem for me. So please do that because I have twenty and twenty-one, and they just don't see a problem with TikTok. So can you help us communicate uh, to people perhaps what the what the challenge is? And these these little humans that my wife and I have produced are, are not only very uh, precocious and uh, uh, cute, they, they just have me wrapped around their fingers. So I fear that I will not be able to withstand the pressure at that moment. So I got to give, I got to, I got to do it before it's too late. Um, uh, so listen, I think the risk as I see it uh, from TikTok, I mean, well, there is just the overall question of what this is doing to our mental health. And there, that's not only TikTok. Admittedly, yeah. that's social media in general. My wife was actually joking last night. She's like, you, you need to like, you need to mandate there's a, a label similar to what you have on when you buy a pack of cigarettes where it's like, this may cause anxiety, depression, and suicide. I actually thought that's not a bad idea. Um, so put, just put that aside for a second. What's unique about TikTok? So TikTok is controlled by ByteDance. ByteDance is a Chinese company that's effectively controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. We now have a mountain of evidence to suggest that ByteDance does the bidding of the CCP. It's had to apologize whenever it's deviated from the party line. It's promised to make sure all future product lines adhere to appropriate political direction. There's CCP officials embedded in the corporate governance structure of ByteDance. So the question we have to ask is whether we want to allow a CCP-controlled company to become the dominant media platform in America. And the challenge is not just that it could potentially track your location or that it has been found to to abuse the power uh, and, and track journalists because journalists were writing bad stories about TikTok. The real problem in my mind is that young Americans increasingly get their news from TikTok. Right. So if TikTok controls what information we get, what news we get, then it allows the CCP via control of the algorithm to determine our sense of reality and national identity. And so that strikes me as a a bad idea. It'd be like allowing to strain the Cold War analogies here. It'd be like allowing uh, the KGB and Pravda to buy, you know, the Chicago Tribune, ABC, NBC, New York Times, and that probably understates the scale sure. of the problem. So figuring out a way where we can either ban or force a sale to an American company, I think is the best path forward. Now, critics of that will say, well, what about the next one? And I can see that point. There are other apps that are problematic. So overall, we have to figure out what is the right framework when you're dealing with a, an app or a piece of technology that control, that's controlled by an increasingly hostile power. That's a difficult thing to figure out legislatively. We're working through it right now behind the scenes. The Senate had an approach that was too broad, and it, it's kind of died as a result of, of that. So we're trying to figure out a more targeted clinical approach that... Um, 
uh, that actually accomplishes what we're trying to accomplish. Well, shifting gears, and we're still talking about ownership here, but we've had some questions in the chat about China purchasing U.S. farmland. So, yeah. you know, we've seen different things in the news about this. Can you can you comment on this and and how real of a threat? I mean, in Texas, I think they're they either they passed it or it was proposed, right, where you couldn't have, you know, Chinese owned companies purchasing land here. I'm not sure that survives later. But I mean, as you as we delve into this, I mean, it, it is sort of a, a, a concerning thing to think about uh, yeah. American farmland uh, being purchased. So is it really happening? to the degree perhaps that, that we're hearing? And then what are the reasons behind their acquisition of, of U.S. land? Well, it is happening. Now, as a, as a percentage of overall land in the United States, it's very small. That being said, they've made strategic purchases of key agricultural companies in America like Smithfield, which could give them, even with the control of a few companies or just a small subset of land, really a, another way to, to uh, coerce us or influence uh, what we do. And I, I, the other thing I think you need to keep in mind, because this is, this, is, this is complicated legally, and some of these state initiatives will get shot down, uh, and some have been better drafted than others. But you as an American an, or an American company could not go buy land in China. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a matter of reciprocity, I think there should be some level playing field here. And, uh, you know, it's the same thing when it comes to, uh, uh, when it comes to the, the question of TikTok and uh, social media. So your average Chinese citizen uh, does not have access to our American social media companies. They can't get on Twitter. They can't get on, you can with a VPN probably, but mm -hmm. those, the, the China, China doesn't allow those companies in their domestic market but we right. allow their officials to go all over our platforms all over twitter all over youtube and spread anti-american propaganda it makes no sense to me as a matter of basic reciprocity where i think we can actually fix part of this issue in this congress is where where land purchases are happening and where i think there's no question legally that we have the authority and that prudentially this would be a smart thing to do is where land purchases are happening near military bases and that's happening in america it's not just the dakota incident. There's one in North, Northern California that my Democratic colleagues are up in arms about. We have a bipartisan bill coming out. There's no question that we should have the authority to deny those purchases. And that's something that I'm cautiously optimistic we'll be able to fix this Congress. Again, I have a bipartisan bill that is, hasn't yet been introduced, but we're nearing the point where we've gotten buy-in from all the different committees. Incidentally, we actually revised something called the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States a few years ago to give them the authority to deny land purchases just like this, CCP land purchases near military bases. But of course, when they implemented the, the, the bill, they claimed that they didn't have that authority and ignored the clear intent of Congress. And now we're having to revise that to make it absolutely clear that purchases like this aren't acceptable. So it's a critical issue. Actually, I think there's sort of three things that we absolutely need to take action on this Congress when it comes to China. The first is CCP land purchases in the United States. The second is TikTok. And the third, which I don't think we've talked about, is this question of outbound. Well, I, I alluded to it in my three principles for decoupling. This question of outbound investment in China. What are the right guardrails we can put on American investors sending money to China so that we aren't subsidizing our own destruction? Those are three things that are hard, but I think we can get it done even in divided government. You know, I think that last piece, there, there, there tends to be, I think, a little nervous energy when we start talking about, you know, infringing businesses rights, right, to, to engage in commerce and engage with, with whoever they want. But I think you made a great point earlier that uh, I, I think we need to hammer home a little bit, right, is we're not dealing with an adversary that operates in free trade. <laughs> and so, and there's no reciprocity for us there. And so, I mean, I think it would be really helpful, Congressman, as we sort of wrap up our time with you, because I want to be respectful of your schedule. Um, you know, we have a lot of folks that are part of the policy circle community, and they often sort of ask, well, what can I do about this, right? as an average everyday citizen, what would you encourage folks to do that have concerns about this, perhaps have expertise or skills mm -hmm. that they want to lend uh, to some of these efforts? What would you recommend that we do? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for just even creating a forum like the Policy Circle. Shout out in particular to some of the co-founders, uh, Sylvie Legere and um, uh, Kathy Hubbard, who have known me since before I was even a member of Congress. So if you need to blackmail me, <laughs> I'll go to them. All the information. Sylvie in particular, when I was an unemployed 
uh, ex Walker campaign staffer, um, sort of going to Cubs games, uh, cheat. So there, there's just a lot out there that um, I, this is probably why my time in politics is limited. But <laughs> sincerely, it's been it's been great to see it move from idea to reality, and just the, the network you built is absolutely incredible. Uh, and I think the more discussions you have like this, how can you? learn more and uh, affect more change. I mean, the most obvious and cheesy thing for me to say is to call your congressman and <laughs> tell them to take China uh, seriously. Um, gosh, that is a, that's a great, great, great question. Listen, I would imagine, I mean, the people in this group are very, very influential. Okay. There are a host of people right now that want to either be president of the United States and or want to be senators or members of the house are going to become coming to you, courting you, talking to you, just ask them to answer basic questions about China. Uh, ask them about their views on, on China. I would argue, and I said this on TV the other day, I think, and again, I'm biased because this is what I do most of the day, but this is the most important geopolitical issue of our time. And it's going to be that way for decades to come. This competition is not going anywhere. And the stakes are so, so high. I mean, we, we tend to think that a, a war between great powers is unthinkable. But all it would take is a minor miscalculation that spirals out of control. And look at just the, whether you support assistance to Ukraine or not, just look at the devastating consequences of what happens when deterrence fails. Uh -huh. this, this, this is the cost and blood and treasure is is enormous and so we should be doing everything humanly possible to deter a conflict with china it is my view that deterrence is only possible and peace is only possible through strength and that we need to operate from a position of strength but nonetheless peace is the goal i mean at the risk of i mean excuse my language the old saying goes war is hell deterrence is hard but war is hell and so that should motivate all of us to be pressing our elected leaders to come up with a coherent view on China. I hope this issue is the front and center of our primary campaign for president, uh, the general election campaign. And it, it just requires sort of um, active uh, citizens like yourself to, to ask our elected leaders uh, hard questions. That's I love a that. Your question. Sorry. That, yeah, that's fantastic. And I, you know, you, you made the plug, call your, your congressman's office and I'm going to say, read your policy circle brief. There you and go. Those, yeah. And those two things combined, I think people really can have a much better sense of, of, of how to frame up questions to identify where a candidate stands on these issues. I think that's a, that's a great outcome of our conversation today. Um, Congressman Gallagher, great to finally meet you. I, I've actually heard wonderful things about you. So uh, I guess I'm not well, asking the right questions, but well, I do want to say- things are true. Everything else is a lie. <laughs> Only the good things are true. Well, we wish you luck and we thank you for your service and uh, look forward to continuing further conversations with you uh, about additional topics to inform our community. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was a real pleasure. And I, I hope to see many of you in person at some point soon. Sounds good. Well, now we're going to take an opportunity to, to shift over and to speak to another expert that has joined us today. And I'm very excited to introduce Jackie Deal. She's president of LTSG, a defense consultancy, and co-founder of AASE, which teaches courses on net assessment, China, political warfare to early mid-career national security professionals. She's led multiple summer studies for the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and her work has been published in outlets including the Journal of Strategic Studies, National Interest, National Review, New York Times, and Politico. Uh, Jackie is a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, co-chairs the Forum for American Leadership's Asia Working Group, and serves on the advisory board of the Alexander Hamilton Society and the Vandenberg Coalition. Jackie, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Stacy. It's my pleasure and an honor to follow the congressman. Well, this is a, a perfect way for you and I to unpack some of the, the, the things that we just discussed with Congressman Gallagher. But I do think it might be helpful for many of us to understand briefly the history. Like, how did we reach this point? And when perhaps was this shift in relations um, that's led us now to this, this place of friction? Yeah, well, um, one place to start would be the end of the Cold War, which Congressman Gallagher mentioned. You know, I think we... Uh, in DC and maybe in the United States took one set of lessons away from that competition, major power democracy versus communist authoritarian autocracy. We took one set of lessons away and 
the people in Beijing running the Chinese Communist Party took a very different set of lessons away from that uh, competition. And I don't think we appreciate it in real time. And I'm worried we still haven't fully taken on board how different our views were uh, about the lessons of the Cold War. I think we thought this <laughs> conflict teaches us that you know, communist or authoritarian regimes, single party states with central planning, they're basically gonna be consigned to the dustbin of history. That model doesn't work. We showed it, we won the cold war. They looked at it and said, we don't wanna make the same mistakes that the communist party of the Soviet Union made. We'd like to stay in power. So we're not going to be poor, relatively speaking and technologically backward. We're gonna take advantage of every opportunity we have to engage with the West to avoid being contained so that we can move up the food chain technologically, economically, and you know, eventually really compete, uh, you know, at least on equal turf, if not on superior grounds, and really show the democracies and the liberal world who's boss. And that's what I think, unfortunately, we're seeing now. It's just that in the 1990s, we thought they get it, we get it, everybody knows history is over, They'll become more like us if we just trade with them, invest in them, engage with them, bring them up the science and technology ladder, things will work out. And in hindsight, obviously hindsight is 2020, but that turns out to have been a mistake. We underestimated the determination of the Chinese Communist Party regime uh, and the staying power of its ideology and its flexibility and its ability to learn from the mistakes of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Well, and I think what's interesting is now, obviously, what we have things in the news daily. We just discussed several of these things that are in the news, but it, it feels like we're playing a little catch up here, right? There was some that naive perception that, oh, you know, we've kind of won the battle of for hearts and minds, and in reality, not so. You know, how many years back would you go when you start thinking in your circles, right? With security experts, folks in Washington, obviously policymakers are, are just now really coming to the table uh, to talk about this. But when did you guys start to, to raise the flag and say, we have a problem? Yeah, um, well, you know, I've, I've been at this for a couple decades now. And I remember in the early 2000s, most people, frankly, were skeptical that we would ever see a kind of a peer or you know a, a military competitor in the People's Republic of China's People's Liberation Army, most people doubted that they would ever be able to threaten the US military or to have technology and capabilities that match our own or exceed them in certain areas. But I remember in 2004, the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, so right now Xi Jinping is the general secretary and he's definitely a problem, but before him, uh, Hu Jintao was considered more moderate, but even Hu Jintao put forward uh, a new set of missions in 2004 to the People's Liberation Army. They, they were called the New Historic Missions. And he basically said to the PLA, your job is not just to guarantee China's borders and the stability or security of the Chinese Communist Party's regime and its rule domestically, which had been their uh, mission, he said, now you're responsible or you're going to be responsible for securing the conditions for our continued rise economically. Uh, and that began to sort of point the way toward a power projection or an externally oriented People's Liberation Army. And I think that would have been a moment where, you know, we could perk up. And in, in fact, people did in the, in the Defense Department. It's just that we were also fighting wars at that time against uh, you know, the people who had come and attacked us on 9-11 uh, and we were fighting other wars in the Middle East. We were in Iraq, we were in Afghanistan. So we had other things on our plate, but but people noticed. Um, and then in 2007, there was a dramatic moment. Uh, there was what, you, what, what people call a direct ascent kinetic kill vehicle. So an anti-satellite test, the Chinese um, used basically, you know, a missile launched from the ground to take out one of their own satellites in space but it was the equivalent of showing that they could kind of use a bullet to hit a bullet in orbit. And that was a major shot across the bow or uh, implicit demonstration of capability to take down our space assets, which are extremely important to American, to the American military, to our way of fighting um, around the world. So they showed us in 2007 that they were interested in taking out uh, our space capabilities they had already been, the PLA had already been given these new historic missions. And then sort of across that decade and beyond it, over the last two decades, basically, we've seen the most dramatic buildup 
of a military since at least the interwar period. In terms of the investments, Beijing, the Chinese Communist Party has been allocating to the military. So we, we often tell ourselves, oh, the U.S. spends more than the next 10 countries combined on its military. We're the most powerful. We spend the most. But actually, if you look at what's happened, um, 85 percent of our budget goes to procurement, um, personnel and operations and maintenance. But most of that, the lion's share goes to operations and maintenance. So we're spending a lot because we're operating our military globally. We're fighting wars. Things are getting corroded. We need to uh, repair old things and keep them in the fight. They're spending on procurement. So mm -hmm. their spending on procurement has, we, uh, my estimate is uh, if, if, if you take the dollar value of everything that they've built and you try to say, what would it have cost us to build that stuff over the last two decades? Um, my team has figured out that basically it's grown more than sevenfold. The inventory, the dollar, uh, the dollar cost of their material, their missiles, their ships, their planes. Ours has barely even doubled in that time because we've been spending so much on other things, basically fighting, keeping up our old systems, um, paying our people, which we have to do. We have the best people in the world. We clearly want to pay them. But we haven't been spending on building new systems and new weapons, and new platforms. And that's why, you know, it seems as though we're getting in some cases outmatched or at least surprised by, say, hypersonics or very exquisite, precise, conventional missiles that can go at long ranges uh, or near space flight uh, <laughs> aircraft, a.k.a. spy balloons. They're building things uh, at a pace and scale that we haven't seen since right before World War II. In other words, the Germans in the interwar period. That is a striking comment that you make at the end, right? Because the history buffs will appreciate the magnitude of that change, which is a tremendous change. You know, as you talk about that shift that, you know, that that China had from that internal to external, you know, sometimes we'll hear about the Belt and Road Initiative. Can you explain what that is? Sure. Well, it's it's kind of Xi Jinping, the general secretary. He's now been in power for a decade, uh, two terms, but, you know, moving on into his third, uh, which is uh, a break in, in recent precedent. Um, and it's his signature grand strategy. It's his idea of we are going to build connectivity in all different ways, you know, not just infrastructure, but also digitally uh, in terms of health, in terms of people to people ties, economic ties. We are going to connect basically the world to Beijing, or he announced it in, in 2012 and then 2013 by saying there's going to be an overland component that connects China through Central Asia all the way to the Middle East and Europe. And then there's going to be a maritime component that also goes over sea and connects uh, China to important trade partners from the South China Sea through the Indian Ocean, again, up to the Middle East and Europe. Um, and so it's a bit to say, actually, uh, this whole post-Cold War, post-World War, uh, sorry, this post-World War II order that the United States created to try to ensure free trade and prosperity, uh, I think our, our line, our system um, is based upon the idea that if if trade can happen uninhibited, that if the sea lines are open and people can kind of um, engage in commerce, everybody will do well. That'll be conducive to prosperity. People will get richer. They'll behave better. And it turns out that the Chinese don't agree with that model or believe it. They think we created this system to keep them down because in their words, that's just what hegemons do. So mm. they are now making a bid to say, we're going to make a new... Uh, Belt and Road, we're going to create a new world uh, of connections that orient around what they call a community of common destiny or a community of shared future for mankind, which is vague. And it sounds maybe OK, but when you kind of re read beneath the lines or read what they say when they talk to each other in Chinese, the community part and the shared part are actually code for communist and socialist and a system that is controlled from Beijing. So that's what they have in mind, rewriting the rules of the international order so that it can be governed from Beijing in ways that the Chinese Communist Party think makes the world safe for them so they can get richer, so that they can impose a kind of hierarchical system that's very different, unfortunately, from the world that we know and appreciate and think leads to peace. They have been so deliberate 
and intentional and this kind of long game, right? I mean, this has been building up for quite some time. So there's already, right, this, this enormous push for their, their power and for the transformation that they hope to see happen. And in that, this, you know, most recent time frame, you know, of the last decade, perhaps, you know, they have had um, enormous economic prosperity. Their, their tactics have appeared to reward them, right, financially and their power and their reach. What happens if the Chinese economy continues in its current downward trajectory? Can we expect them to become even more aggressive, perhaps, if they become a little more desperate in that economic sense and shifting more to military, you know, corporate espionage? Do you think they just up the tactics if they become a little bit more desperate economically? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, you know, in, in some ways, we're seeing this play out already right now. I mean, the premise of your question is slowing growth. And they have had their period of 8 to 12 percent dramatic rapid growth, at least according to their figures. You know, they had that for the first decade, give or take, of the 21st century. And they've actually been in declining or much, much slower growth now for, it's a little hard to know, but but for some time now, just last year, their official number was they only grew at, I think, about 3%, which, you know, I, many people think that their numbers are a little bit inflated or fudged. Uh, one of the memorable lines is, you know, our GDP growth is in the United States. It's a matter of, you know, what we measure after we count up how much economic activity there was at the end of the year. Theirs is an input number. It's a target. And so then all the factories and all the economic planners or managers, state uh, owned enterprises go to try to match the goal. So it's very hard to know what's really happening, but by their own numbers, they were down to 3% last year, which, you know, again, if you kind of squint, that's kind of like two, two and a half is where we've been traditionally. So they're not uh, the juggernaut that they were. Um, and that makes sense because already by 2010, they had become the second biggest economy in the world, at least measured by purchasing power parity statistics, we think. They had surpassed Japan. That's over a decade ago. And it kind of makes sense that once they're the second biggest economy in the world, um, the world can't keep buying eight to 12% more Chinese stuff and their model was exports. Mm -hmm. So they had to switch and they haven't really figured that out totally yet. They're trying. And, and Congressman Gallagher, um, alluded to this. He said, you know, we need to be in the United States and uh, among our allies, we need to dominate the most important technologies, or at least we need to have access to them and not be dependent on China for them. Their line is, or Xi Jinping's line is, you know, we want to, uh, master we want to be in a dominant position over the quote unquote fourth industrial revolution. They, they industrial revolution. They think they can, by controlling certain key technologies and choke points in the in economic uh, activity and supply chains industry, they think they can use that leverage backed by the PLA to kind of again secure enough growth to stay in power and be ascendant, uh, surpass us over time. So. They've closed the gap, and now they're in this moment where the old model of selling us a lot of cheap stuff on the back of laborers whose wages they've suppressed, you know, that's not going to fly anymore. So they're looking abroad. And, and you mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative. That's a search for uh, reliable access to resources and also markets and labor. They're also starting to shrink uh, in demographic terms uh, already. Last year, I think, according to their official line, was the first year that they have actually shrunk. Um, and that means that it's not just that they're not growing in terms of their population, but the dependency ratio. So the number of old people and very young people who have to be supported by the middle of the uh, population, the working population, that number is going up for them. So there are a lot of issues. And I think that they're, dri that they're driving Xi Jinping to what has clearly been much more aggressive, assertive, ambitious, mm -hmm. uh, in your face behavior yeah. around the world. Well, talking about in your face behavior, you know, we've got some questions in our chat and, you know, we've talked about this in our brief, but, you know, you've got corporate espionage, you've got the, you know, theft of intellectual property and then academia. The fact that we have known issues with, um, you know, CCP planting folks in academic and research institutions. And then, you know, uh, I, I think those tactics and that aggression is something that should get the attention um, of every American. We didn't even talk about the the police stations that are, you know, the CCP having their own police forces here that sort of enforce some of those uh, tactics, forcing, you know, Chinese nationals to engage in espionage. Talk to us a little bit about how rampant you, this, this espionage and theft 
of, of American intellectual property and especially that academic setting? Yeah, that's a great question, um, Stacey. And thank you um, for asking it. And thanks to the listeners for posing it. Um, I think the FBI is up to $600 billion annual annually is how much they say we're losing in intellectual property theft. So the theft of trade secrets and technology um, and other important know-how from unauthorized, you know, cyber access or people who are working in a company and turn out to be insider threats and take the know-how they've learned from the company or the lab or the research institution and send it back to the PRC or go to the PRC and are uh, able to set up a rival entity there. So if $600 billion is how much we're losing annually, it's that figure is so big, it's hard to even understand, you know, <laughs> Yeah. Where do you begin to count, you know, the lost, um, the opportunity cost of, you know, money that was not gained from the fruits of intellectual property and innovation and advances that were then st that were stolen instead, the, the money that was not gained from from those innovations because they were stolen right. and can't go into future R&D and investment in research. Seeing, like a piece of this, right? Because it just magnifies that loss. <laughs> And already a decade ago, there was a bipartisan commission that said this was the greatest transfer of wealth in human history. And that was over a decade ago now. So $600 billion a year. I mean, these figures are eye popping. And right now there's a debate about what to do. A decade ago, they said that? Yes. And what has been done in the last decade to, to stop this, Jackie? Like what is being done to counter? Obviously, there's intelligence issues, but what's being done? Well, I think the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, has been engaging with U.S. firms and universities, you mentioned academia, and trying to get the word out and trying to uh, ensure that companies and victims can talk to each other and figure out best practices, best practices to counter the threat, share insights. Um, uh, it, I, there has been actually also a concerted effort to look at what's happening with universities that make deals with basically effectively arms of the Chinese Communist Party that say, we're gonna come to your school and offer free Chinese language instruction or subsidized Chinese language instruction. And we're gonna send in our people and we'll help you and we'll help educate your students in Mandarin. But it turned out, this is through the Confucius Institute program. It turns out that those centers then became outposts of the CCP on US university campuses where they could be used to run espionage or intimidation against students who say came from China, but wanted to express concern about what's happening to the Uyghurs in Western China, who are the victims of a genocide or the people in Hong Kong, you know, who've lost their freedom. Basically on US campuses separate or in addition to all the espionage, there's also been this issue of students not even being free and not being able to enjoy uh, the American experience of college and free inquiry. So there's so many issues here that you know, I, we're beginning to address and they have, we've made some progress, but there's a very long road ahead. And frankly, there's some very difficult issues for Americans. You know, we want to treat all students uh, as students, but if they're coming from China, it's an issue because even if they don't want to be affiliated with the Chinese Communist right. Party, the Chinese Communist Party is going to claim them. Right. And if they end up doing something of interest to the CCP and Beijing, and then we're in a, they're in a very difficult position. We're in a very difficult position because we can't necessarily know about that or protect their families if they decide that they don't want to be helpful to the CCP. So uh, these are extremely difficult questions for a free society and a democracy to face. Well, and I think you bring up such a good point for us, right, in, in terms of, you know, we don't want to oversimplify any of these issues because there is a great deal of complexity. But I do think that, you know, what you're bringing up is especially important for us to be thinking about is that as average everyday American citizens, we need to be more aware, right? We need to be more cognizant that there is a threat and not to be naive and not to be reluctant, I guess, to ask the questions. I liked how Congressman Gallagher encouraged us to start asking policymakers, you know, where do you stand on these issues? If you had to frame up a great question, Jackie, that we could take and we're, you know, let's say I get to get in front of a, a presidential candidate, what is a, a tough question that's gonna show that somebody's really taking this threat seriously? What would you ask? 
Well, I, I really loved his answer. And one of the thoughts I had is, you know, you can ask your congressman or you can ask your senator, and that's important. But you also need to ask your state and local government. You need to get to your state legislator. You need to get to your public universities in your state and start asking all these questions, uh, raising raising alarms about uh, surveillance cameras purchased from the PRC, drones purchased from the PRC that police stations are use, have been using across the United States, other electronic commitment uh, equipment that the Beijing subsidizes it so that we use it so that they then have eyes and ears, you know, in our communities, in our law enforcement, in our governments. And again, this is not just at the federal level, this is at the state and local government, it's at, at the level of school boards, you know, which, which equipment are you purchasing? Um, are you ensuring that arms of the CCP can't be influential in your schools, in your curriculum? Um, because it's not just at the university level, unfortunately, it's gone down to the primary and secondary uh, education level. So I love that theme. Um, one of the issues that I think is pending both in terms of an executive order that's been rumored to be coming from the White House and uh, potential legislation on the Hill is the issue of outbound investment restrictions. So uh, Congressman Gallagher said, you know, one thing we should stop doing is helping them build uh, the capabilities to fight us or intimidate us. And one of the ways that's happening is because the United States is financial institutions, investment institutions are sending capital to Beijing to go to dual use or military purposes. And that that has to stop. So I, I, uh, I would ask, yeah, what do you well, feel? I think you this? framed this up perfectly. And of course, as the policy circle, we love that you took this local, right? Because we are really encouraging our community to engage at that state, local, school board, city council, county commissioners. So I think all of us probably just got a real wake up call. Like this is something that is not, uh, again, as Congressman Gallagher said, far away. But to your point, we really need to be paying attention how we procure, who we cooperate with. And I love that we landed there, Jackie. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, I could talk to you about this at length, but I, I want to encourage everyone. Um, you know, Jackie's information is in the chat, but follow her work. Um, I assume you're on social media too, Jackie, so we can follow you uh, on some channels there to see some of the work you're doing. But I just want to tell you that we appreciate you sewing into our community and helping us understand these issues better today. So thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. And all right, everybody, this is all that we have time for today. We are so grateful that you've carved out some moments uh, in what I know are your busy schedules to become more informed, more equipped, and more connected with our community. If you found this uh, program today of value, which I hope you did, um, consider joining the Policy Circle. Uh, $100 uh, a year, $10 a month, that enables us to put together this type of quality programming. This helps us put together these, these very thoughtful and comprehensive policy briefs that are built specifically for you as our community so that you have a trusted resource uh, and you can really get to the bottom of issues like this threat of China. So again, we are so thankful for our community. We hope you'll continue to learn more about what we have to offer as the Policy Circle. And please tell us more what you're doing in your communities. Check out our resources and join us for our next Move the Needle, which we will have in the fall. We'll see you again soon.